Welcome everyone uh, to the P5 webinar today, uh, November 19th. Today, we're going to be hearing about the future of buildings, transportation, and power. And uh, we, have a, we have a guest speaker. Uh, my name is Dub Taylor. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Texas PACE Authority. And I've got a couple of introductory slides that I'm going to go through before I turn it over to Roger. So um, let me just... So what is PACE, the Texas PACE Authority? Texas Pace Authority. Hold on. PACE is Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. Uh, this is a simple way of paying for capital projects, uh, energy and water savings capital projects with no out of out of pocket money. It's 100% financing for energy efficiency, water conservation and distrib distributed generation projects. And in Texas, commercial and industrial owners can take advantage of PACE financing as well as multifamily. Uh, five units or more. The key to this all is it's repaid by a special assessment on the land uh, that is aligned to the useful life of the improvements. In Texas, it's voluntary and open market. State law created this authorization for PACE and local governments enable it. Our organization, the Texas PACE Authority, we're a nonprofit uh, formed in Texas specifically to administer PACE programs on behalf of local governments. So we work for local governments. Uh, the property owners who to participate in PACE, uh, we work with them to help define uh, projects on their properties and help determine eligibility. We work with different capital providers to uh, put financing to those projects. Uh, we do not provide any funding ourselves. And then we work with the service providers, the contractors that actually do the work. And in Texas, PACE has really been growing. Uh, authorized in 2013 originally. Uh, we now work for 55 different uh, cities and cities and counties around the state, uh, from very small ones to very large ones, uh, covering about 60% of the state's population. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop my screen and turn it over to Roger and let him take over. And uh, before he does, I'm gonna make a few introductory comments about Roger. Uh, the previous, first of all, the previous T5 webinars that we've had, and T5 uh, stands for TPA Third Thursday at Two Training, have really focused on different aspects of PACE implementation and the different actors involved and the different roles they have. But today is a departure from that operational focus, and we're going to look around the corner, so to speak, to hear about the future of buildings, transportation, and power from the co-author of a recently released book by the same title. California had a guy named Art Rosenfeld. He was a UC Berkeley physicist and California Energy Commission uh, chairman and commissioner who was dubbed the godfather of energy efficiency. And who he in 1973, after the second Arab oil embargo, shifted his focus from particle physics to energy efficiency, uh, thankfully. Colorado has Amory Lovins, who in 1985 coined the term megawatts to describe the application of technology and best practice to eliminate waste based on the attitude of do the same or more with less. And in Texas, we have Roger Duncan. Roger really got the energy efficiency conversation started here through his vision and his work. And just a brief bio on Roger, he is a former research fellow at the Institute, at the Energy Institute of the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the former general manager of Austin Energy, the municipal electric utility for Austin. And prior to that, he served as executive manager for several city of Austin departments, including the Environmental and Conservation Services Department and Transportation, Transportation and Planning. He was also elected to two terms, the Austin City Council um, in the early 80s. And in 2005, Business Week Magazine recognized Roger as one of the 20 leading carbon reducers in the world. And in 2009, National Geographic recognized him as an international thought leader in energy efficiency. So we're so pleased to have Roger join us today. And he's going to share some thoughts uh, and cover some topics in his new book. And uh, Roger, let me turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Doug. Um, let's see. Can you see me in the presentation or not? 
Not yet. I can see you, okay. but not the presentation. Okay. Let's see if I can figure out what's going on here. How does that? I still just see you. Okay. Uh, bear with us, folks. Uh, let me go back to Zoom. How's that? There we go. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Dub. Uh, uh, thank you for reminding me how old I am. <laughs> I, uh, as Dub said, I started uh, with the energy efficiency a long time ago. And in fact, uh, uh, when I was first elected in 1981 to the city council, I brought Amory Lovins to Austin and together we sat down and wrote the first energy conservation plan for the city. And so uh, we've been doing this a long time. And I uh, wanted to share with you today uh, uh, some thoughts that um, have been developed over the last few years with uh, my co-author, Michael Weber, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at uh, University of Texas. Um, regarding the future of buildings and transportation and power. And um, uh, Dub has graciously allowed me to give you a few comments on the book in general, and then I'm gonna focus some on commercial buildings in particular uh, in the uh, of building trends and what's happening. So the agenda for today is I'm going to give a, an overview of the book and then talk specifically about commercial building efficiency and the building trends that we're seeing today. And then in particular, what we think the future holds for uh, buildings uh, in general and what they're gonna look and feel like and, and act like, uh, if you will, in the future. Um, <clears throat> the book is The Future of Buildings, Transportation and Power. Um, and we break it into five parts. Uh, and the first part that I'm gonna talk about in a minute is called the energy efficiency megatrend. And I'll explain what we mean by that. And then we discuss in sections two, three, and four, the future of buildings, transportation, and power, and end with uh, some of our conclusions on what we think uh, will actually happen in these areas uh, in terms of sustainability and obstacles and such. So, First, um, you know, we started this book with just, uh, I uh, joined Michael Weber over at the Energy Institute uh, in the early uh, uh, 2011, 2012. And we sat around and, and talked some about um, the energy crisis that everyone was talking about. And, and um, it raised the question because essentially I asked, well, look, everything is energy. I mean, we, normally think of energy in terms of gasoline in our cars and electrical power and converting coal or gas or solar to energy. But we know through Einstein and others that everything actually is some form of energy. Um, and we also know that we can convert energy to perform work. And so we asked sort of the fundamental question of uh, if everything's energy and we can convert energy to perform work, then what's the problem? Why is there an energy crisis? Why are we concerned about the amount of energy we have? Because everything is energy and such. And it really gets down to uh, that second word, convert. Convergent efficiency turns out to be really the source of our problems in general. And so as we started looking at the history of technology and, and future technology, um, we put forth the idea that there is an energy efficiency megatrend, that there's a general progression of efficiency in energy conversions throughout our history of technology. And uh, I'm talking about all technology from the first wheel and lever up to the most sophisticated robotics of today, uh, that really the purpose of technology is conversion efficiency, taking any form of energy, whether it's in the form of a traditional fuel 
or a jelly donut that you ate yesterday and converting it into some form of work, uh, generating electricity, powering a vehicle, or simply picking up a table and moving it from one place to another. And as we did that and looked at the sectors we were interested in analyzing, buildings and transportation and power, and we took those three sectors because um, most of our energy, like 75% of all of our energy conversions are in buildings, transportation and power production and transmission. Um, there were three consequences that essentially came out of the energy efficiency megatrend. And one is that these functions of building operations and moving vehicles and so forth will be met in the future with less material, less motion, and less time in, in involved. And that's the energy efficiency megatrend. It also means that uh, sentient appearing machines will emerge. Um, and that's not a consequence of some um, um, supernatural or sci-fi theory or anything. We're creating our technology so we can interact with it in such a way that uh, it's it acts as if it's a person. That's why we are talking to Siri on our phones and Alexa in our homes and, and so forth. And more and more, our technology will emerge as, a, as an individual that we're interacting with because that's the most efficient way for us to develop and interact with our technology. And then finally, we noticed that uh, again, because of it is more efficient, that buildings, transportation and power are starting to converge in many ways. And I'll mention that some more later, but uh, the essence of the matter is that each of these sectors can perform their functions, whether it's moving vehicles or generating electricity more efficiently by inter, inter converging and interacting with the buildings and the transportation uh, and the other sectors. So, the second section of the book is on the future of buildings, and I will go into this sector uh, in more detail, uh, where buildings become more energy efficient. We're dealing with smarter and faster construction of buildings. Uh, the, the buildings themselves will be smarter and more automated. The convergence with transportation and power sectors, as I mentioned, I'll talk about sustainable buildings some, uh, some of the new roles that future buildings will take on that we may not be accustomed to, and uh, what I call sentient appearing buildings that will emerge in the future. I won't go into detail on these other sectors, but they're in the book and we'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this about any parts of the book. But we also go into the future of transportation, energizing of transportation, the electrification of vehicles of all sorts, uh, and sentient appearing transportation um, starting to emerge, including new transportation modes like uh, Hyperloop uh, trains, um, supersonic aircraft are probably coming back, uh, as well as in the future, even suborbital uh, uh, aircraft and such. Uh, and we also discuss in the book that there are some difficult transportation sectors uh, to wean off the of petroleum, particularly large uh, international aviation and uh, maritime shipping uh, will be di very difficult to um, get off petroleum as we uh, try to move to a cleaner future. We have a section in on the future of power in which we talk about the changing electric utility industry, um, uh, the changing transition, the decarbonization of our fuels, moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy, the decentralization of the industry to uh, on-site generation from large centralized power plants, uh, energy storage, even the changing electric utility business models that have to take place to accommodate this changing industry. Uh, in chapter eight, we put forth some of our clean energy solutions as in this transition. And finally, we talk about advanced power systems. And in the last chapter, we talk about what we see as the uh, sustainable future coming forward that we mentioned earlier in the book, as well as some of the major obstacles to obtaining that future, such as the embedded energy 
not only in existing buildings, but the embedded energy and all the concrete and steel and other energy that we have to put in building wind turbines and electric vehicles and solar panels and so forth uh, as an obstacle, as well as the critical elements and materials involved in uh, electric vehicles, for instance, and wind turbines and such. Um, we also see that electricity itself emerges as an obstacle to this new future, uh, because as we depend more and more on electrification of other sectors of our economy, uh, outages become more and more devastating uh, to the economy. And then finally, complexity itself is a major obstacle in achieving this, this future. So let's get to the topic that uh, we're most uh, concentrated on today, which is buildings and particularly commercial buildings. Um, first, some projections uh, from the uh, EIA, uh, the United States Energy Information Administration, uh, they're projecting that up to the year 2050, that commercial space will increase at the rate of about 1% per year, but that the energy consumption will actually decrease by 0.2% per square foot per year. And that is a, um, uh, that's a tremendous achievement uh, that they're projecting, but it's in trend with what we've seen over the last couple of decades as we start to install the energy efficiency measures uh, uh, in, our, in our building infrastructure and the declining in, in electricity intensity that we're projecting in the future is mainly in the areas of lighting, refrigeration, space cooling and heating, ventilation and water heating. And you see, of course, these are the same areas uh, that are being addressed by the PACE program. Um, because this is where your biggest bang for the buck is. Uh, when you can change out uh, the lighting uh, from the old fluorescent tubes and, and such to LEDs and in the future OLEDs and such, uh, you get a tremendous uh, energy and cost savings with uh, very little investment. And I will go into some of the new space cooling, cooling uh, systems and so forth uh, that will be coming up. Uh, but lighting accounts for the largest decrease that's being projected in the commercial building sector up to 2050. Now, we're also seeing an increased electrical use in commercial buildings. Uh, and I think there's a couple of areas uh, that uh, we're going to see uh, EIA projects that increase the greatest increase is going to be in office equipment, um, obviously computers and as we get more and more electric. Uh, but there are some new devices out there like uh, if you put a 3D printer in your building, uh, you need to look for a jump in your electric bill. They're tremendous uh, consumers of electricity. And I think more and more commercial buildings are going to have to deal with the increase in electric vehicle charging. Um, electrical vehicles are a small portion of our transportation sector now, and most people today in this early days are charging their vehicles at home. Um, but as we get a greater portion of the transportation sector electrified, uh, I think that particularly commercial operations that have large parking lots or parking garages and such uh, will start putting in charging stations and other types of equipment. And it is a great benefit to electrify our transportation sector. But as you do that, that load doesn't disappear. It is being transferred over to the building sector. Uh, and commercial buildings, I think as we move on into the future, are going to see more and more of their energy load uh, switching to uh, daytime charging of uh, electric vehicles. Okay, one of the trends that you're seeing in the commercial sector that's occurring today is faster construction. And I gave a couple of examples here that I, I have in my book, uh, a company called Broad Sustainable Building, built a 30 story building in 15 days. And another company uh, whose name I, I will uh, mangle if I try to pronounce it, uh, built a 10 story basic building structure in 48 hours. 
And in New York, uh, there's a company called Forest, Forest City Ratner that builds apartments and they have apartment modules being manufactured off site that can be lifted and fitted into a modular high rise project in as little as 12 minutes. Uh, this is a trend that we see uh, continuing into the future uh, as more and more uh, manufactured housing takes place. And uh, again, through um, artificial intelligence and robotics, we're seeing faster and faster construction. And a major element in this and, and in the future going forward, this, uh, skip the slide, is the use of robots in construction. Uh, robots are being used now in everything, in demolition work, inspections, sorting, construction waste, painting walls, finishing concrete floors, welding frames, conducting layout measurements, masonry, bricklaying, dot, dot, dot. Uh, there's a whole page worth of examples now of uh, robots being used in construction and finishing, and not just the construction. In, uh, the design of the buildings, uh, management of the work site themselves. Uh, uh, more, uh, we have now sites now where the trucks and the heavy machinery on site are being operated remotely, um, and lots of prefabricated building parts uh, being manufactured. One company in Baltimore, uh, Blueprint Robotics, uh, used workers' robots and machines, and they pieced together in the walls and roof and arrive at the work site already 60% assembled. Um, more and more your construction sites are going to be uh, managed and controlled by robotic construction machines and equipment uh, with uh, fewer and fewer people on site. Um, there in the farther future, uh, there are companies that are already talking about being able to take designs that were generated by uh, artificial intelligence and, and generative design technology and just turning it over to, in essence, robot companies that procure the equipment, prepare the site, and construct the building on site. Um, I think that's where we're headed for further into the future. One of the technologies that is changing the, uh, the building industry today and, and all industries, I think, is 3D printers. In fact, I consider 3D printers one of the three or four technologies that's transforming our entire economy. Uh, in the uh, construction sector, uh, there's a, a Chinese company called uh, Winsun Decorative Design Engineering uh, that has a 3D printer that is 490 feet long, 33 feet wide, and 20 feet high. And it completes the basic structure for a home, 10 homes in a day. And I understand their goal is to get it up to one per hour. Um, and these homes are not only built in that amount of time, they're, used, uh, they're using recycled construction materials to build them. And these homes can be demolished and ground up back to a particular uh, particulate size combined with a glue-like substance and then use as feedstock to go back into the 3D printer and print another house with a different design if you wish. Uh, closer to home here in Austin, a company called Icon has produced the first fully permitted up to code 3D printed house. They're, they're small little houses, uh, but perfect uh, for addressing the very low income and the homeless uh, shelter problems. And they're working with affordable housing programs, not only in uh, the United States, but uh, starting to produce uh, affordable housing subdivisions in uh, Latin and South America now and other parts of the world. 3D printers, are a fundamentally new technology, I think, that uh, will transform a lot of our company, including the building sectors. And um, we probably need to stop thinking about 3D printers as this uh, uh, device that sits on your desktop like your paper printer does, uh, but they're coming in uh, all kinds of shapes and sizes now 
uh, producing all types of materials. Um, and there could be a whole lecture on 3D printers. Sustainable building. Um, some of the innovations you're gonna see in the future, uh, there's truly radical insulation being developed through nanotechnology. Uh, nanotechnology is developing, uh, there's companies like uh, Nanopore Insulation, and I'm forgetting the other name of the other company that's starting to develop uh, insulation that is, has such small pores that the gas particles can't get through it without bumping into other uh, structures. And it is increasing the insulation properties by an order of magnitude over our current products that's going in the homes and buildings. So it's truly uh, uh, a leap of an order of magnitude in the insulation that we're going to have in future buildings. We're developing smart windows that can control light coming in and thus heat uh, gain and so forth, uh, both responding to light and environmental features as well as being electronically controlled uh, to uh, make windows more or less transparent or change their characteristics. Uh, uh, National Renewable Energy Labs, NREL, has developed uh, desk and evaporative cooling systems uh, that, again, will increase the efficiency of our air cooling systems probably by an order of 50, 60 percent uh, from where they are today. Uh, there's new technologies like paints that you can put on your rooftops that will actually have a cooling effect uh, because it does it through an, an evaporative uh, technology. It's called solar cooling plant. Uh, new building materials. There are skyscrapers starting to be built now from wood. It is a, a compressed laminate structured uh, wood product. Um, but uh, it is fireproof and um, uh, meets all the code standards and can build now multi-story uh, skyscrapers uh, from sustainable wood produced from uh, sustainable forestry. Uh, intelligent efficiency is a catch-all term uh, for all the smart uh, appliances that we're seeing coming into buildings now. Uh, the turning on and off of a, appliances and timers and motion detectors and so forth, all combined with what we call now intelligent efficiency and, and integrative design, um, you know, where you start out at the beginning and see what impact the new cooling systems and building materials and passive architecture and all are having on the systems integration with each other and um, uh, achieving much more sustainable building in that manner. <clears throat> Future buildings. One of the things that um, we have to look forward to in the future is that the roles of the buildings will change. Buildings um, will become more health monitors in some ways. And you're seeing this now primarily in um, uh, retrofit of homes for senior citizens and in some uh, uh, senior subdivisions. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, allergies are attacking. But um, homes and future buildings can be fitted with sensors and detectors and artificial intelligence. So that you can start monitoring uh, whether or not a person is, has fallen and, and can't get up even to the point of where they're having a temperature or not, or their behavior has changed in such a way uh, that it causes alarm, uh, that they need assistance in some way. Uh, and at first it's gonna focus on our, our senior citizens, uh, but uh, I think more and more it will become a standard operations that uh, the buildings will start to participate more in a society-wide health infrastructure um, to monitor and respond to the health situation of the peoples involved in the buildings. The other role of the buildings that will change is that we're seeing now is that many buildings are becoming essentially power plants. And uh, I know many of you are 
working to put solar on your buildings and take part of your load off and such. But if you think about it, there are a lot of, no, not, not perhaps a lot, but there are certainly buildings that are massive structures that have very minimal power loads, uh, parking garages, um, uh, schools in summer, um, and uh, schools right now for that, for that matter. Uh, several other buildings, warehouses that are not air conditioned and such that have a lot of surface area for very minimal uh, usage, uh, stadiums for uh, our football teams and such are sitting there unused a lot of the time or used in such a way that they have a very minimal energy load. And if you cover those buildings with um, advanced solar technology and hook them up, essentially those buildings are becoming power plants for the electric grid. And um, we're, for instance, we're seeing now uh, almost all the NFL uh, football stadiums are being converted and put uh, have uh, solar being put on them as well as those other major uh, stadiums and arenas. I think this will eventually work its way down to the colleges and the high schools and so forth. And you'll see a lot of stadiums retrofitted with solar. Uh, warehouses, uh, reservoirs uh, with, that can be used uh, for surface areas. A lot of the buildings are gonna be primarily power plants for most of their usage. Uh, and interconnected with the grid in such a way uh, that, they, uh, that they become part of the grid infrastructure. Another trend that we're starting to see, uh, and particularly in, in some countries such as uh, Italy and China and a few others, is the development of what are called urban forest. Uh, many buildings uh, and new commercial uh, structures are seeing the value of uh, greenery and trees and shrubs and so forth and using terrace type structures to plant forest. And, um, and this can be quite expansive. Uh, I don't have the statistics in from my book at the tip of my tongue, but you're seeing urban forest areas that's essentially establishing small forest uh, throughout the urban landscape. Uh, in the future, you may be approaching a big city and it may be looking like a large uh, grass uh, forest covered mountain rather than skyscrapers. Um, the, the use of greenery and, and forestry on the terraces and built into the structures itself is becoming very popular and particularly in China and like I say, Italy and some in France and uh, a couple of other nations are starting to encourage and uh, incorporate uh, living uh, plants and such uh, into the structures themselves um, into the buildings, uh, which is, leads to another role of buildings, which is those of carbon scrubs. Um, when you cover a building surface with plants, it's removing carbon from the atmosphere. We also are developing synthetic carbon uh, filters that can be applied to services. Uh, th this isn't new, I mean, uh, submarines for years have had devices to remove the carbon from the atmosphere. In the future, I think a lot of, most of our buildings will be using their surfaces to start to extract the excess carbon from the atmosphere and store it in a useful way uh, to address the climate change issues. Uh, of course, some of our buildings now are tremendous, electric loads through data centers, uh, financial centers and banks are becoming primarily data centers at this point. Uh, we'll also in the, see in the future more indoor agricultural or urban forms. The urban forms that we're seeing now are mainly marijuana growing devices. And believe me, um, it is causing havoc with the electric utilities in some places. Uh, where you have these large uh, marijuana growing facilities developed. They are tremendous uh, consumers of energy. Um, uh, a, a, what's called a grow closet uh, in, in a home can consume the power of 24 refrigerators uh, running at the same time. So, uh, and I, 
expect to see more use of indoor agriculture, not just for marijuana cultivation, obviously, but for the growing of uh, particularly leafy vegetables and uh, indoor gardening and such. And then finally, uh, we're seeing, I think, just the beginning of the convergence of buildings with the transportation and power sectors. When you put solar on your roof and energy storage in your garage um, and uh, connect some of the energy efficiency and demand response devices uh, that you can uh, respond to the electric grid with and connect, put that smart meter on that allows the utility to talk to those uh, devices and grid, you're converging the building sector with the power sector. And now the transportation sector as it electrifies and plugs into the buildings and the power sector is starting to use the batteries and the electric vehicles as essentially capacitors and energy storage for the electric grid. More and more buildings, transportation and power are converging in their functions and starting to interact with each other. And uh, I don't have the slide, but in the book, we have a triangle that shows the interaction in both the movement of power and information between buildings, transportation, and power sectors uh, converging into a, a single unified energy system. Finally, the other thing that uh, we're going to see in future buildings uh, more and more is the artificial intelligence systems. Um, I, I call them in the book sentient appearing buildings. Uh, right now, uh, I can go in my living room and call out Alexa and get it to play uh, the tune that I the radio station that I want or um, more other homes can control the lights and other structures and so forth. More and more the um, devices like Electra and particularly the energy management systems that we're uh, installing in our homes and buildings, I think those will evolve into more master control and artificial intelligence systems. Um, now you're seeing uh, systems that are, are controlling uh, not just the, uh, the energy systems, but the security systems, um, the uh, other monitoring systems, uh, tremendous amount of, of electronic intelligence being um, developed in the building and interconnecting with the internet and, and the intelligence grid outside. Um, I mentioned in the book that buildings will become, in a sense, more autonomous. Um, today, we think of energy management systems as just controlling the buildings, but as the, the systems become more and more sophisticated, the buildings themselves can start to make decisions about their own maintenance. Uh, buildings may be able to start accepting deliveries uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the occupants of the building. Uh, they may be able to, uh, uh, in your home, uh, the refrigerator may uh, determine that you're running out of milk uh, and just put it on the list and order the next uh, round of groceries, uh, which are delivered and then installed right into the pantry or refrigerator of the home or building and so forth. Uh, the combination of the artificial intelligence with built-in robotics within the building is gonna transform what these buildings feel and look like and what it's like to be inside the buildings. Um, right now we have a laundry room. And when we say laundry room, we mean the little room where the washer and dryer are located when we go in to do the laundry. In the future, the laundry room may be the place where you go drop off dirty clothes in a bin and forget about them. And then at some future time, come back and pick up your clean and wash and folded clothes. Um, the dishwasher that we hand load now may become in the future a kitchen where you drop off your dirty dishes in some place and then later you just take out the clean dishes that have already been stored in, uh, uh, in, in the cabinet. Uh, more it, uh, we have, I have a little uh, robot um, floor vacuum now, uh, Robo. 
uh, that a lot of people have. Buildings, more and more commercial buildings, for instance, may have built-in robotic systems that uh, when everyone goes home at night, the robotic systems emerge from the walls and clean the building and then move back into place for the next day. Uh, you may have manufacturing facilities that are specialized to manufacture certain products and the energy and the robotics are built into the structure itself. Um, so more and more of these buildings are going to become not only smarter, but more autonomous in that respect. Uh, I mentioned built-in power systems, solar roofs, smart windows, energy storage, grid communications, electric vehicle connectivity. Um, and there's an element in the future called programmable matter that's in its early stages, but it allows um, to a limited extent, extent um, shape shifters in buildings. Uh, you may have hail damage from that uh, thunderstorm that moved through the other day, and the materials on the roof may be able to heal itself. Uh, we have uh, self-healing concrete uh, materials being developed now, for instance, that, that uh, resolve the cracks that form within the concrete. Uh, in the far future, it may be getting even more extensive so that uh, matter that's built of this programmable matter within buildings can reshape itself and perform new functions on command. Um, the walls may serve multiple functions with the use of printed electronics um, and other uh, devices. Uh, your walls and surfaces may become your computer screens or TV screens and such as you move about the house. And in fact, moving about the building may be different. Um, right now, we have a somewhat primitive motion detector so that if I go into a room, the lights come on and I'll leave it and the lights go out. Uh, more sophisticated systems may follow me around uh, the building such not only do the lights come on and off, but if I sit down, uh, the table in front of me becomes a screen and picks up that document that I was working on uh, in the other room before I walked into here. Um, um, the light may become a speaker that uh, communicates to me when I get a, a call that I need to talk to someone about and so forth. Um, so the combination of the robotics and the artificial intelligence systems and things like print electronics, programmable matter and so forth is going to make uh, the building itself much more um, fluid, if you will, and less solid and dumb uh, as it seems today. Um, there's a great book by David Rose that I mentioned called um, Enchanted Objects, I think is the name of it. Uh, and he points out that, um, what is that play, The Beauty and the Beast, where the teapot and the lamp and all talk to you and so forth, that in the future, more and more our technology around us is becoming enchanted in that sense, that we can communicate with it and interact with it. Um, in fact, in the future, we may talk to something and if it doesn't respond, we will assume that it's broken. Uh, so that's what we have to look forward in, uh, in uh, future buildings. And I'm going to conclude and leave us some time for questions uh, here. The uh, conclusion is that uh, commercial buildings of the future will be built faster with less loom and labor. Future buildings will be intelligent and interactive. They'll take on roles that we don't currently assume like health monitors, power plants, and other roles. They'll be more integrated with the transportation and power sectors and they'll be much more self-sufficient and autonomous in decision-making and interaction with our urban environment. And Dub, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you now and ask for questions and uh, ask me about anything, whether in the presentation or uh, that uh, may be of interest in the book. Great, thank you, Roger. And thanks for spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, if you do have a question, you can use either the chat box, type it in there, or use the Q&A and uh, 
I do see one uh, question in the chat box, and I think I'm understanding uh, what this is asking. Uh, but uh, the question is, what we see in a, in a post-COVID world, we see an adjustment in the expected growth versus new H HVAC uh, indoor air quality impacting watts per square foot. I think the I think the question, what 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 he's getting at there is, we're obviously um, uh, more sensitive to uh, the uh, indoor air quality issues and, and having uh, healthier indoor environments, which require maybe moving more air, uh, treating air in different ways, uh, which, which has an energy penalty. So in a, in a post-COVID world, some of these trends we're seeing where, where maybe we are uh, making efficiency gains on the equipment side, operationally, we may be using the equipment in different ways that may negate that. Uh, any, any thoughts about that? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I think that you're seeing an, an energy load shift during the COVID phase, and now some utilities are starting to produce data and such of the, the different, uh, the way that the load is shifting to residential uh, structures during this, this COVID phase. And I think that's important because, as Doug and I were discussing before the webinar, I think after COVID, uh, you're not going to see a hundred percent movement back from the residential and teleworking into the commercial offices and so forth in the main urban centers. A lot of that load's going to stay at the residential. Uh, but certainly, uh, as you install new air air infiltration systems uh, and other advanced technology uh, uh, into the commercial office structures, uh, you're going to see increased loads. Uh, I think the question is uh, that I have is to what extent is the increased efficiency in the development of the new technology is going to be offsetting those loads. Um, in general, computers, for instance, are a tremendous new load and has been growing in our as a percentage of our total energy load, but it's certainly not been growing as fast as the computer usage has been growing because of the efficiency gains that we've been seeing in the electronics and the computer chips and so forth. And I think you'll see that also occur in the technology that's dealing with air infiltration and other uh, responses to COVID that we're gonna see increased loads, but we're also gonna see increased efficiency in the technology uh, that will offset those increased loads to a great extent. Great, thanks, Roger. Uh, another question that came in: uh, Great presentation. Uh, what type of uh, skill set is needed to meet these high-end requirements? So, as we're evolving uh, from a technology standpoint, how how can uh, how can education and, and and trades and skills development uh, keep up? Well, that is a great question, and. Uh, I unfortunately do not have a good answer to that. Um, traditionally in the past, uh, over the you know, 100, last few hundred years, we've seen a progression where technology has taken a certain sector like agriculture and uh, automated it and lots of law, jobs have been lost, but the jobs moved to another sector uh, like manufacturing in the city or uh, when the manufacturing became more automated, the service sector started expanding new jobs and, and, and so forth. Um, and we see, you know, training and certainly in skills and running computers and, and so forth. Um, I am not at all certain that that trend will continue. Uh, it is difficult to say what new skills uh, you need to develop to deal with an artificial intelligence system that is expanding very rapidly and moving very quickly. Um, the jobs that are usually lost are not the same people that can get retrained to new jobs usually. Um, we have uh, a new industry um, coming up with uh, and, and the, the transition to renewable energy from fossil fuels has created a tremendous number of new jobs and it is the skill sets we know of uh, solar installers and so forth are an obvious answer. But for the coal miners and Appalachia and so forth, 
they're not the people being trained in those new jobs. And as we get into higher end requirements with artificial intelligence uh, and such, particularly as the systems are learning to train and develop themselves more and more, um, the number of jobs and the skill sets are getting smaller and smaller in my opinion. And so uh, I would urge education to become more tech savvy as much as possible. And also point out that the last sectors that get automated and, and move to artificial intelligence, all the skill sets that involve human interaction uh, more um, in human skills. It's very hard for robotics to learn uh, simple things like gardening, for instance, and certainly uh, massage and dealing with um, uh, other types of, of human uh, action. It isn't impossible, but it's slower. And um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we, Roger, we got another question. This one uh, is sort of, uh, uh, you, you should be able to hit this one out of the park. Uh, the question is, what role can local government best play to be ready for and promote future energy efficiency technologies? Let me make a note or, or two here. Um, well, I think that uh, and it's important for local governments, first of all, uh, to form uh, they can do it in, in two ways. And, in, and I mentioned that local governments that own or work with their electric utilities have a tremendous advantages over local governments that do not. Um, local governments can work through codes and standards, uh, particularly building codes and, and such to uh, promote the energy efficiency and green building, sustainable building. They can also work with electric utilities and other sources to help provide the capital that's necessary uh, for the energy efficiency transition. PACE is one example of a program, uh, but if they work with their local utilities, they can, in my experience, sort of stair step the use of incentives and rebates from the utilities with codes and standards from the city to ratchet up the efficiency of uh, buildings and appliances that uh, go into those buildings and other uh, uh, standards and so forth. And they also can work with utilities to make sure that new construction is compatible with things like electric vehicle uh, connectivity and uh, solar installation in the future and energy storage being built in and so forth. Uh, so it's the combination of the uh, the regulatory controls that local governments have uh, to work with uh, the capital side and particularly the electric utility side uh, to find a synergies there that, uh, that achieve the energy efficiency you need. Great. Well, uh, we have on the screen, actually, there we go. A, uh, we're kind of winding up our time here for this afternoon, but on the screen again, this is the cover of the book, uh, The Future of Buildings, Transportation, Energy, and Roger, we appreciate you being with us this afternoon and, and covering some of the topics uh, in particular related to buildings. Uh, I, I guess we should not uh, discount your co-author uh, on this, uh, uh, Michael Weber, who uh, many on the call uh, probably know a uh, longtime professor at UT, uh, now I believe is uh, working as the chief technology officer uh, for NG and splitting his time between uh, Austin and Paris. Uh, look for his other publications as well. But, uh, but I, I, again, thank you for taking time this afternoon. Oftentimes we do get sort of buried in the operational weeds and, and, and don't get an opportunity to sort of rise above that and think about what's next, uh, what's around the corner and how uh, things we're doing now can evolve to address those future needs. So for the participants today, uh, we will have a recording of this webinar that we'll put on our website. It'll be in the same area as the other T5 webinars under the, uh, the drop down for resources and education and training. And uh, we appreciate your attention today. 
and your attendance and uh, look for the book. I know it's available via the normal channels, Amazon and any, any, any uh, 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 book publication uh, uh, website and of course uh, bookstores, you, there's still bookstores and they're good to visit and go into as well. So look for the book and, uh, and, and look for uh, future uh, discussions and, and publications by, by Roger. And uh, with that, we'll close today. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, everyone stay safe and enjoy your upcoming holidays. Thank you very much, Dub. Thank you.